This, this lecture is about the kinds of symbols that various cultures uh, use for writing down numbers. Um, and the symbols we use for writing numbers are, are often quite different, not just, to, of course, in, in appearance, but in the actual structure in terms of the way that we might use words to indicate those numbers, such as we've studied recently. Um, in a positional number system, uh, such as ours, the, uh, the use of a symbol uh, and what that symbol means depends on exactly where it is in the number. We use the same digit 3, but sometimes it stands for 3, and sometimes 30, and sometimes 300, and things of that sort. Uh, on the other hand, in a non-positional system, uh, such as Roman numerals, we would use one symbol for 1, a straight bar for Roman numerals, another for 10, such as an X, a third for 100, such as C, uh, etc. Uh, and it's useful to point out that just because a language uses some kind of a base for their number words, there might be a base 520 or something like that, uh, base 10 built in to their number words, that doesn't necessarily mean that if they express those, those numbers in symbols that they will use any kind of a base uh, or if they do, that it will be this, that it, it's not necessarily guaranteed to be the same base. <clears throat> now, uh, to take a, just a glance, we're going to sort of eventually do more of a historical sort of a thing. But if we take a look at the kinds of numbers that we use, it's it's interesting to take a look at a little bit of their history. So here are the Hindu Arabic uh, number symbols that we use, and these are just a, a couple of examples of occurrences um, that uh, where we see these these number symbols. And sort of looking through some of these, these are both here from India, uh, quite different symbols for three, and it's not clear that both of them are predecessors uh, to our number system, but you can sort of see the three lines, one, two, three here, but they've been connected between this form and this form. And you can see the three lines in various forms here, usually, again, one, two, three, connected in some way so it can be done with more or less a single stroke. Here, and this happens fairly regularly, we see this has been rotated from what we would think of as three horizontal lines to more or less three vertical lines. I hope you notice that the number two is also essentially, in most of these instances, rotated from the form that we would use. Uh, some of these number symbols have stayed quite constant um, over the time, so seven has a big loop and a, and a stick, and then it turns into a, so, a different loop and a stick and then simplifies in one form or another to the seven that we're used to. Um, eight has been fairly consistent in Europe. Uh, here we have the beginnings of sort of the, the portion of an eight that we're used to. One of the things that's sort of funny though is the symbols for four and five. Uh, these are, this is a very nice simple symbol. You can sort of see uh, a number four hiding inside there and maybe inside some of these other things. But what's uh, surprising is the number five and how much it actually looks like a four through much of its development. Now, if we were to rotate this by 180 degrees, it would actually begin to look a bit more like a 5, and especially this last form that I have here from the uh, uh, early 13th century. You, if we were to rotate this by 180 degrees, you can sort of see a 5 here with the standard little, you know, uh, uh, hat that you put off uh, when you're actually making the 5 in writing. Uh, I mention this not because I'm going to spend um, uh, any more time on kind of this history. I, I find it interesting. Uh, to sort of see how these numbers have developed. Uh, but there is an awful lot of uh, nonsense um, on the web. So, for example, this is uh, something that's been going around on Facebook and many other web pages. It is this uh, false history um, that uh, the, the, the digits that we use come from sort of the number of angles within, uh, uh, within, a, within the various digits. Uh, and I hope you re realize from that previous screen that most of these things have very little to do with the actual origins of the number. Um, this is sort of looking at the development after several thousand years, looking at what they turned into, and then saying, well, gee, if I, could, if I wrote these in exactly the right way, I would end up having the total number of angles inside here. And almost everybody actually writes a four with the line coming all the way through. So, uh, and this form here where we stop it there, yes, some fonts use that, but that's not what most people use and it's not what historical um, use of this has been. Okay? And it is sort of cute that you can draw the digits in such a way that the number of uh, angles is equal to the number uh, itself. 
but uh, that's not how they were drawn. As I say, that's just sort of a fantasy history, an alternate uh, reality kind of thing. Um, but my interest here really is not, so, not on the Hindu-Arabic number systems, but rather on some of the earlier systems, and especially uh, the non-positional number systems that were used at the beginning. Uh, the first positional notation system arises in uh, China during the Qing Dynasty, probably about 1200 uh, BCE. Before that, everything was uh, non-positional, and um, essentially, there's uh, uh, some stuff about this time that's happening in uh, Babylonia as well. Uh, the quipu that we know from the Mayans is a positional notation, uh, so that uh, the you know two overhand knots representing the number two could be twenty, could be two hundred. It's not a true positional notation though, because we have some special symbols for the ones digit. So the two overhand knots can be a twenty or a two hundred or a two thousand, but cannot be a two. Um, and uh, of all of the various non-positional number systems that are, are uh, that are around, the one that, that you're sort of most probably uh, somewhat familiar with are the Roman numerals, where we use, uh, uh, for example, with the base 10, we use a 1 and a 10 and a C and a uh, M for 1, 10, 100, and 1,000. This really has sort of a dual base system, though, because we're also specializing, we have special numbers for the intermediates. So we have a special symbol for 5 and 50 and 500. And uh, if we were using positional notation, that doesn't work very well. You can't really start to mix bases and use some fives and some twenties or some fives and some tens. But it works just fine for these non-positional systems. Uh, but going back even further than, than sort of Roman numbers, the oldest systems of all are really sort of tally marks, where you just sort of make marks on something. Um, you know, on a, a piece of wood, a, a piece of bone, you know, and just mark things off the way that we often do ourselves in keeping track of simple numbers. So let's start our, our history by looking at a little bit of the uh, tally marks. Uh, this isn't coming up all that well here. Um, this is a, a, what's referred to as the Ashengo bone, a bone, and uh, there's a whole bunch of these little striations on it, these little marks that appear to be tally marks um, all along it. Um, but even if we can't see that picture real well here, we'll sort of uh, talk about some of the issues here. So the oldest known tally sticks of this form date back to about 30, 35,000 BCE, the Upper Paleolithic uh, era. And so this kind of use uh, or apparent use of uh, simple numbers in the simplest possible form, what we could almost think of as a base one notation. You just use ones over and over and over again uh, to keep track of something or other that you're interested in. Uh, these could have been used for counting. They could have been used for calendars. That's, that's a very possible uh, uh, idea. One of the early uses in cultures that we know the history of is to, for, for math is to use mathematical calculations for various sorts of calendars and astronomical events and stuff like this. Uh, Claudia Zaslavsky suggests uh, especially because some of these tally systems seem the, the, the tally bones that we have in which people have kept track of numbers seem to be cycled around roughly the length of a woman's menstrual cycle that it might very easily have been used uh, to keep track of that either for issues of keeping track of fertility or for keeping track of when they're going to have to be worrying about bleeding uh, or keeping track of even things like pregnancy and stuff. Uh, so we're not sure um, the Ashango bone, which I tried to include a picture of here, uh, is, a, is, is newer than some of these oldest ones, but it still dates back to uh, 18 or 20,000 BC. <clears throat> and so it's very possible that by this point, people have been using tallies and, ta and counting basic numbers for really quite a long time. Uh, and one of the odd things about the, the Ashango bone is that there's an awful lot of tallies that where the groupings for the, the, the tallies, there, there will be like five marks in a row, uh, five being a prime number, and then there will be 11 and 13, and a surprisingly large number of prime numbers. Um, and so, of course, that means that there's an awful lot of, of possibly wild speculative conjectures about these people sort of playing around with prime numbers and trying to understand them. This probably is a, a coincidence. One of the number groups here is nine, and nine is certainly not a prime. 
So maybe they were just sort of interested in odd numbers or something like that. Seems very unlikely they can actually have been interested in prime numbers because uh, it's another 15,000 years, uh, no, even longer than that. Uh, it's not until about 500 BCE that the concept of division really becomes uh, well known in any culture. So it's hard to understand prime numbers without understanding the idea of division. So it seems unlikely that that was the case. Um, <clears throat> there are some marks in the centers, uh, in the center of the uh, Shango bone, which look like doubling uh, um, things. So that will, there will be a five and a 10 and a four and an eight. Uh, and the use of doubling turns out to be fairly important uh, in Egyptian uh, number systems much later, around 2000 BC. Uh, and, and the idea of uh, doubling numbers is part of the algorithm that the Egyptians are using for doing multiplication. Uh, the Ashango bone itself comes from the Ashango region which is uh, roughly on the border of the Congo uh, in the Uganda, but it is one of the headwaters uh, of uh, the Nile. So it's conceivable that this doubling stuff that's going on in the Ashango bone is actually related to uh, much later Egyptian cultures. But even that is a pretty wild speculation. Uh, but it is sort of a fun uh, uh, thing to take a look at, and certainly does represent a very old example of these uh, tally systems. Well, when we're looking at tally marks, um, you're probably used to some of other forms of tallies where we sort of do these groupings, such as uh, this one, uh, a grouping by five. And one of the reasons for that is that experiments show that humans really only see things in a single glance up to about four. Uh, if, we, if we give you a very, very short amount of time to see a group of five, uh, it's hard for people to actually realize that that's how many there were there. People seem to have to, in their heads, do little clumpings, and there's a clump of three and a clump of two, and then they're adding those together to get the number five. And so, but up through four, most people can just sort of take a look, oh, there's a group of four right there, and they immediately see that number. And so the idea of then going to five and having some special mark, such as a, a slanted line or a line that crosses them, uh, to indicate a group of five is something that's fairly common. <clears throat> um, these, these two are also known as the barred gate uh, approach. And um, this one here is kind of interesting, especially when we get to Roman numerals, and so we'll look at some examples there. But this idea of counting and grouping by fives really appears in one form or another in many, many cultures. We'll certainly we'll see that also in uh, the Chinese number system that we look at shortly, and in the Mayan number system, uh, and the uh, Roman number system, things like that. Groupings by five in one form or another. Well, let's take a look at, uh, again at the Roman numbers, uh, just as an example of uh, some of these tally marks. So when we're looking at something like this, and these, these are some tally marks that come from uh, the Roman era, and we can see these uh, striation, the, the symbol lines. And of course, we've spent some time looking at, at hand signals, and so I hope you appreciate that it's very likely that these smaller numbers uh, for counting in Roman numeral, numerals and other places that are just using lines are very po are possibly descend from, or at least are strongly connected with, using the fingers for one, two, three and four. This of course is assuming that we're in a system in which the counting has the numbers, has the fingers going up as we go through. Interestingly enough, the number for five, if I now extend my thumb and don't make, don't make the effort to hold my hand uh, together, then what we have here in the hand is in fact a, a V, a five. And so we might have gotten uh, a slanting line as happens here, that's sort of you know upside down, that's, that's the thumb um, sticking out, or we might have gotten, uh, you know, again, this sort of seems, in this sense, to be upside down. There's a V, and here's another V here. But that idea that the V might come from the, uh, the, the palm of the hand seems interesting. Again, not something we can really be sure of, uh, but that may be it. The X for 10 uh, is uh, something that we're also not very sure of. As we get into the larger numbers, L, C, D, 
D, M, those are related to essentially the first letter of a word that corresponds in Latin to that concept, but X does not. So where does X come from? Well, one interesting possibility is that if I have my two hands, and the, this is a, a five and this is a five, but I want to say that they're part of the same thing, if I overlap them, then of course my thumbs form an X. Uh, this would form the V, but this would form an X. We don't know if that's how they got it, but it's an interesting possibility at the very least. Well, let's go to Egyptian numerals. This is the Roman numerals or system that I'm assuming people are reasonably familiar with. Uh, Egyptian numerals are fairly similar um, to the Roman numerals, but they're, they're a pure base 10. We don't have V's and L's and D's in there. It's just base 10. Uh, so there's no special symbol for those things. And we get a different symbol for each multiple uh, uh, of 10. So in the number I have over here, this is the symbol for a 1. Here's this, this upside down U is the symbol for a 10. Uh, this is a scroll that represents 100. This is a water lily that represents 1,000. And uh, we sort of just kind of clump things together. It doesn't really matter what the ordering is. It doesn't matter whether I put four of these in a row, or if like this, put them in a double row arrangement, I could put those four in, in two rows of two. It would all represent the same number. That's not particularly uh, crucial. And it's also, of course, we can read it either right to left or left to right when we put the numbers down, because we're just adding all the numbers up. This is sort of important because in Egyptian hieroglyphics, uh, sometimes they will be reading right to left, but other times the reading goes this way and then comes around and goes the other way. It goes back and forth across the script. So the fact that the numbers can be in either order um, is sort of useful for that particular kind of script writing. Although the symbols, will, as we'll see in the next screen, are slightly different. So um, this idea here, uh, this comes from uh, the number 4,622. So here's our 4,000. That's written in a straight line the way that the Romans would have done so. With six, though, in, instead of putting them in a line of six, which, which we know from the psychology experiments, that's hard to see. So I put it in two groups of three, so it's very easy for anyone to say, ah, oh, yes, it's three plus three, there's, there's, that's a 60 right there, uh, sorry, 600 uh, right there. If we were to put it in a straight row of six, since unlike Roman numerals, we can't collapse five of them into a single one, and if I put six in a row, then it's, it might be fairly easy for somebody to accidentally read it as a five or a seven instead. But if I arrange it in this sort of uh, two-dimensional um, structure, then it's easier to sort of see what the actual number is. Okay. Um, we'll see the same kind of clumping behavior uh, happens with uh, Babylonian numbers as well, where we'll sort of have several symbols and we'll kind of pile them on top of each other to make it easier to sort of figure out what the count is. Um, let me tell you a little story here. Uh, many years ago, uh, back when the freshman seminar courses would actually take day field trips to someplace off campus, we don't do that anymore. But in those days, we did during the new student days. And uh, I took a group that was interested that were, what we were studying for the semester was numbers and the history of numbers. So I took them to the Oriental Institute in Chicago, and we were taking a look at a bunch of the old number systems, uh, uh, number instantiations there. And they had a stela, an Egyptian stela, which was a, an inscription of a letter. And uh, uh, having looked at a few other things and, and found numbers on various other places in the institute, uh, I made sure that all the students came over to see a number uh, that was um, essentially right, one scroll and two of these horseshoes. So the number was 120. Uh, and I was telling the students, see there, you can recognize that number. That one, it's one of the things we've been talking about. And the docent who was taking us on a tour sort of pulled me off to the side and said, no, no, that's not really the number 120. It, it can't be. What this letter is about is a young boy who's writing home to his father about just having gone through the, uh, the ride into manhood where he got, um, uh, where he got circumcised. And so she says, there's, there's no way that the number 120 would be any place in that letter. And I said, well, okay. I mean, it certainly looks like the number 120, um, but she was the docent, so I you know, took her at her word. But except that when I got back, I decided to verify this, and so I wrote to the director of the Oriental Institute, um, and he sent me a full translation of that particular stila, 
which included the fact that the boy who is in fact writing home to his father uh, about getting circumcised, but he tells his father that there were 120 boys who were all being circumcised at the same time. So, uh, yes, when you see these particular symbols being used, they're not also being used for something else. They really are ending up being used as the number symbols uh, for Egyptian hieroglyphics. Um, here's an example. Here's is a bit more detail on the actual number systems, the number symbols themselves. And different artists will have different sorts of forms for, for how they're doing things. So that this, this particular symbol here, some of them are being very elaborate about the tail here and some are not. And you can see a lot of variation here, but you can also see, of course, a whole lot of similarity. It's kind of curious to, to look at what these numbers mean, um, the number symbols, and something about what they represent. So that number one very likely just represents a finger. Uh, the 10 uh, seems to represent a, a, a heel bone. So that might indicate counting on our fingers and our toes, and when we have completed counting the body, uh, well, no, no, I'm sorry, I should take that back. So this, the heel bone, uh, you, you know, if, we, if it was in fact counting on uh, hands and feet, then it would, would end up being some kind of a 20 base system. So I'm not exactly sure why this system, this, this particular symbol, and, uh, is supposed to represent a heel bone and represents the number 10. Some of the larger ones become a little bit more obvious, and what's kind of interesting about some of these here is the way in which the thing that's being represented occurs in magnitudes, in collections of roughly the size of the numbers being represented. So the first one, um, is uh, can be the, can be viewed as either a coil of rope, and you'll see that in a lot of places. It seems to me more likely to be a scroll, um, as, as at least some authors have interpreted it. By the way, I should mention that since we can write hieroglyphics either um, right to left or left to right, they'll do a mirror image of the of the symbol when they're reading it in the uh, when it's being read in the other direction, so it's just the going back and forth form of reading. But if I think of this as a scroll, then that would be fairly natural we, uh, to represent 100, because if we think about uh, sort of a library of that time, not the big library at Alexandria, but some other form of library or somebody's personal workroom or something, they might have something on the order of 100 scrolls. If this is an intellectual, they're probably not having only 10 scrolls there, but they might have 100 scrolls, but probably not up into the thousands or something. So this is reasonable to represent something at about the order of magnitude of 100. The next one is a, a water lily, and if you've seen lilies, water lilies uh, blooming you know, in a nice big uh, pool, you can say, yeah, a thousand. I'm going to have about a thousand uh, blossoms there at any one particular point in a nice big expanse of water lilies. I'm not quite sure what this bent finger, the pointing finger, is representing. Why this represents 10,000, I don't know. And that would require, I think, a s more research into some of the cultural aspects. When I first saw this symbol as, the, as a 10,000, I was thinking that Maybe this was being interpreting it wrong. Uh, I can imagine this as cattails, for example. And again, the, you know, that water-based, Nile-based uh, 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 culture, um, I could imagine having some large expanses of essentially all cattails, and 10,000 would, would be about the right number of those. And, so, and some of these I could interpret that way. But some of these, if you look closely, it appears that there really is actually a fingered nail that has been drawn on it. So I think interpreting it as a pointing finger is correct, but I don't understand why that represents 10,000. Unless we're having you know, some sort of scene where we're imagining the whole city is gathered together and the pharaoh is making pronouncements and they're all pointing at the pharaoh or something like that. Uh, I don't know what else might um, represent something of this sort. Uh, but aside from this, many of these, many of these other things, and we'll see the same thing here, seem to represent something of essentially the bright order of magnitude. Uh, this is a fairly elaborate uh, tadpole. Um, it's kind of, if you're going to get into this much elaboration, it's nice that it's uh, with a very large number that you probably don't use very much. Uh, a lot of time has been spent on, on drawing these things. But again, if you've ever seen uh, the uh, uh, tadpoles 
uh, in you know in spawning season. Yeah, a hundred thousand of those. Uh, um, they, they're not all going to mature into frogs and stuff, but still, 100,000 of them, that's about right. Now, this one down here, though, is, a, is something where there has been some controversy. And most sources that you will see re represent, talk about this as uh, the astonished man. Oh, my goodness, look at all those, okay? Uh, or something of that sort, some, something that is surprised by this amazingly large uh, magnitude. More recently, though, the proposal has been made that this actually represents holding up the stars. So this is a god who is holding up the, uh, the sky, the nighttime sky, with the stars in it. There are now millions, millions and millions of stars visible to them. That would certainly be uh, believable. Um, and knowing whether or not that really, that that's what that represents, and think and understanding a bit more about that uh, could tell us a little bit more about their mythology. For example, it's possible that the god that's being represented there is the god Nun. Um, Wikipedia suggests maybe it's uh, Her, a different uh, god. Uh, but what I think of when I the, the reason I suggest Nun is because of this particular picture here, this portion of uh, e Egyptian mythology. So this is Nun. The god Nun, the embodiment of the primordial waters, lifts the barge of the sun god Ra into the sky at the moment of creation. So this, both this, the sun and the scarab are representing Ra, and, his, and Nun, the, one of the creator gods, is lifting them, lifting him into the sky. Now I'd like you to look at the pose uh, for this particular character and compare that now with the uh, pose here that's being used to represent this one million. And so, in fact, if, uh, if this is uh, none, uh, the, uh, you know, the, the, the shape, the, certainly the way that this is being drawn, could represent that. And our legends don't say anything about none putting the, the stars in, in the sky, but it is saying that he's lifting Ra into the sky. Now, none is the embodiment of the primordial waters, but to them in their mythology, the sky itself is composed of waters, uh, much like in the biblical uh, story where God separates the waters of the earth from the waters of the heaven. We usually think of that as meaning the, the, the oceans and then the clouds and the rain um, as the water from heaven. But uh, here they really think of things like the Milky Way and the, the trail of the sky as if there were water up above. And Ra takes his daily, his daily trip across the sky in a boat so that there is that equivalent of uh, the concept of a watery shell, a river that's flowing up uh, above us. So it's possible that Nun uh, might have also been responsible at this point, not only with putting the sun into the sky, but with putting the stars into the sky at the same time. We do not know that from the legends that are passed on, uh, the, the legends that are written down, but we do know that there's an awful lot missing from our understanding of the creation stories. Uh, that there are sort of gaps that we just don't understand. And so one of the things here that's kind of interesting is that it is possible um, that if, in particular, if this, if the symbol for one million does represent Nun raising the barge of Ra um, into the sky, that this might tell us a bit more about uh, what this legend's legend is, that in fact Nun is also responsible for putting the stars in the sky. Again, just an interesting possibility would require some more research, but it is an interesting phenomena that we might be able to use the math symbols, the number symbols, to understand more about Egyptian mythology. Let's switch over now to the uh, Chinese number systems. So um, we're going to go back essentially to tally sticks, uh, and as I say, this dates from about 1200 BCE. It's done in a base 10. Uh, and here we do really have positional notation. And so here are the numbers, the basic numbers, uh, one, two, up to five. But then as soon as we get above five, we do a grouping. So here, the, if these are vertical lines, then a horizontal line is representing five. So this becomes five and one for six, and five and two, and five and four for nine, etc. But what happens is that we alternate between using a vertical representation and using the horizontal representation. So we can also have numbers that look like this up through five, 
And then when we do a six, we do a, because these have been horizontal bars, the vertical bar becomes a five, plus one is six. Five plus two is seven, etc. And they would use these then to combine them together into larger systems. And the vertical lines are being used for the ones and the hundreds and the ten thousands, but those alternates. The tens places, so the ones place is going to use a vertical line, but the tens place will use a horizontal line. Hundreds place will use vertical, thousands will use horizontal. Vertical, horizontal, etc. And that goes back and forth. Okay? So uh, here's an example. The, uh, at, at this time, 1200 BCE, they're, they're using what we refer to as counting boards. So they're going to have some sort of a physical layout in which we keep the numbers here as we're trying to solve different kinds of math problems. This is a little picture uh, of a person using a counting board. This is, uh, this is actually is a Japanese picture, but they have imported these ideas as well. So there you can see the sort of squares that have been marked off and they've got some rods in there that are being used for keeping track of these numbers. You'll also see how this goes from primarily vertical to horizontal to vertical. Same thing here. Vertical, but there's the five, so that's the number nine, the digit nine. Vertical, horizontal with a 50. Nothing, which would have been vertical, and a horizontal here of five for the 5,000. So there's a, there's a blank here, and if we write these, if we're working on counting boards, this becomes very obvious that we have this kind of uh, a blank uh, there that, that essentially represents zero. Um, and that works really well for these counting boards because you don't have any problem seeing a zero, it's just a blank. But if you're then trying to write some of these numbers down onto a scroll or something, you have to be a little bit careful, but not, not as careful as other, you don't have to worry about things quite as much as other um, uh, base systems because since this is horizontal and the, and the next digit here would be horizontal, there has to be something else in there. There has to have been a vertical. So just even if I wrote those all right next to each other, I would know that this has to be 5,089 because it can't, there has to be a zero. If it was 589, we would instead be using that symbol for the five instead of this one. So although there can be some issues with writing these numbers down, uh, um, there, that doesn't arise nearly as much uh, in, in terms of problematic issues as with some of the other systems. Okay. Let's move on to the Mayan numbers now. Take a look at them. Uh, in our uh, visit to the museum on Monday, we will be looking both for some Mayan numbers and for some Babylonian numbers. So you want to make sure you understand what these numbers look like because we're going to be searching for them on a particular um, stila. And so uh, the Mayans work fundamentally in, in a base 20, but with uh, groups of five or a minor base of five, um, what we would refer to as a mixed base. So the individual numbers, this is the first system that's not using lines for tally marks, but is using dots for tally marks. So one, two, three, four. And then I use a line as a grouping of five. And since this is a base 20 system, here's five, six, seven, eight, nine, and then 10 becomes two bars, and 15 will become three bars, and 20 might become four bars, uh, but, uh, well, in, you know, you might think that it would become four bars, but it doesn't quite ever do that, because, of course, it then becomes a one dot for the next position up. Uh, the Mayans are also the first people in the world that we know of as I've mentioned before, to actually use a symbol for zero. This is a, a seashell, uh, presumably an empty seashell with the, nothing left inside it anymore to represent that zero. So for ex we have some examples down here. Let's get some more of the uh, uh, text here on this screen. So we're using these dots and bars, and they have a real honest-to-goodness zero symbol, the first one in the world. Uh, and this system dates back to at least 36 uh, BCE, the conjecture, because of some other uh, um, uh, some other evidence, but it's only evidence kind of leading towards not not very conclusive, is that this might date back to about 400 uh, BCE. Um, but with the the earliest one that we know of, where they're specifically using this uh, a rock stela, comes from 36 BCE. So let's take a look at some of these um, examples here and uh, with some larger numbers, and so their positional notation reads from top to bottom. 
So this is the number uh, essentially 2, but of course it's two twenties, and then this is the number 8. So altogether that's representing the number 48. <clears throat> but you have to be very careful not to put, you know, to put things together. Imagine, for example, over here, so here's a three-base system. There have a singleton and then a single bar. Now, if you weren't careful about this and sort of squished them together, you might think you have a six. So again, spacing becomes fairly important here. So this is one, but that's a 400. So 20 times 20 gives you a 400. This is a five, and it's 520, so there's another 100. And then we have 13 down here, so the total number is 513. Um, things are actually a little bit more complex than this because uh, uh, in its use as a calendar, which is a very, very common use, and certainly it's, it's where we see the numbers the most because those are, you know, dates from calendars are inscribed on various kinds of stela to represent some tremendous thing that's happened or something like that. And so that second, uh, the, the, the uh, multiple, the, the third digit, should represent 400, 20 times 20, in a, uh, uh, in a good base number system. But here, in fact, they replaced 20 by 20 with 360. Not with 365 for a year, but with a number that's pretty close to a full year, um, and yet is still a multiple, you know, is within the, the, the 20s. You know, 365 would cause extra problems in terms of calculations. 360 now, because it's still structured around a base, a multiple of 20, becomes a little bit easier to work with in a variety of things, a variety of forms. But at least here, when they're using this, it's not a true base 20, but it's approximately a base 20. I think that this, uh, um, you know, I say here that when it's used as a calendar, the 400 is replaced by 360. That might be true for all of their numbers, but I'm not sure about that particular fact. Uh, it's also kind of worth noting that, they, that the Mayans uh, were very, very concerned about uh, astronomical issues. Um, we're the first people in the world to get a, a length of year better than uh, 365 and a quarter days. Our standard system is 365 days in a year, a leap year, one every, one every four years we toss in a leap year. And if you stick with that, you have pretty much the calendar that many of the ancients uh, knew about. Not all of them even got the, the quarter year. But those that did, that was as far as they got. Our current system then replaces that by saying, well, we'll drop the leap year on the, on, uh, the hundreds, on the centuries. So most centuries don't have, like 1900 and 2100, don't have a leap year. And then we have a further modification where, where years that are multiples of 400 are, do get a leap year. So we, our calendar tries to get as close as we can to the exact number, um, which uh, uh, if we were to do the astronomical calculations, 365.242198 um, days. And in fact, the system that the Mayans used knows that the year is 365.242 days. So they're good to three-digit accuracy, whereas even other cultures like the Babylonians um, and the Romans who worried about this sort of a thing uh, only gotten, you know, got the approximation of 365.25 days. So the Mayans were the first ones in the world to get much closer than that. Okay, we have one more number system we want to take a look at. This one's going to be slightly more complex. Um, and uh, so these are the Babylonian numbers, the numerals, the Babylonian number system. And I've shown here uh, a bunch of the examples uh, uh, of these, of the numbers that they have here. Basically, Babylonian numbers work off of a base 60, and so each, but it is a position notation, and so each digit position needs to include one of the numbers from 1 up to 59. Now, they don't have a symbol for 60, they don't really have a symbol for 0, um, and so that causes them some problems, but they do, in fact, use all of the numbers from 1 to 59. Some people like to view these as if there it was a true base 60 and you just actually did have 59 different symbols. Uh, that seems to sort of overlook the fact that there is sort of a base 10 kind of thing going on here because we have this one symbol here that uh, sort of groups together um, 
uh, things in, uh, in tens. So here's 10 and 20 and 30, uh, 40, 50. These should look, uh, should remind you of the Egyptian stuff where as we get into groups that are larger than, than three in this case, they're going to sort of clump them together and put some things on top of other things, much as the uh, Egyptians did. And that'll work up through fives for the fifties. But if you look at some of these other, um, the ones places here, okay, there's one, two, three, four. Now we start getting a pyramid effect. Five, three on top of two, and there's six. When we get to seven, it's a three, three, and one. And eight is three, three, and two. And nine is three, three, and three. Um, so this is the way that their number systems are constructed. Uh, so sometimes this is just viewed as a base 60, um, but it does have these groups of 10, so it really does qualify as a mixed base, partly base 60 and partly base 10. Um, and uh, as a result of this sort of partial base, they only need to have two symbols, uh, and uh, uh, everything can be done in terms of that. They're using positional notation very much like the, the Mayans, but the Mayans, of course, do successive positions uh, you know, coming down vertically. In Babylonian numbers, we'll do things horizontally the way we're sort of used to doing it in, say, English. But they do this grouping of the symbols, much like the Egyptians. OK, well, putting space there for all 60 numbers, uh, we can't see them all that well. So let's take a little close-up of some of the cuneiform numbers. These, of course, are being made by taking certain kinds of wedge tools on uh, soft clay. And you basically push the tool into the clay, press it in, um, and then it leaves the mark behind uh, on the clay. We'll be seeing some examples of that in the museum uh, on Monday. But I hope you can sort of see we're using basically one kind of a stylus for base 10 or another kind of a stylus for the number 1. They might even be the same stylus because a lot of times you can get different symbols by just holding the stylus that you're using slightly differently. But they might have had multiple different sort of shapes of these little uh, tools that are being then shoved into the clay to make these marks. When we get larger than uh, base 60, then we're using a positional notation system. Uh, when we're writing down kind of the equivalent of their numbers, uh, in Hindu Arabic things, we'll use digits to, to separate things, uh, sorry, commas to, to separate the individual digits. Uh, but they would use a, a blank space uh, to, sh to uh, you know, they're going to use clumps of symbols and then blank spaces for zeros to sort of separate the, their numbers. Okay. So for example now, let's, let's sort of decipher what's going on here. Um, here I have the number 2, then I have, uh, this is a 20, Essentially, that by itself is a 20, and this is a 7. So we would interpret that as being a 2 in sort of the 60s place, and a 27 in the 1s place. Uh, this particular exercise where I took it from, they're imagining squaring that number. So this, here we go, it's uh, two 60s plus the number 27, so that's 147. And if we were to square 147, it turns out we get... 21,609, but what's really important is this is 60 squared, 3,600. That's 60 squared. So we need a 6 in what we would think of as the hundreds position. We need a 0 in the 60s position, which is for us the equivalent of the 10, and then a 9 in the ones place. And so the way this is actually written on the tablet that has this calculation, here is the 6, and here is the 9. Um, and this is, the only way to tell that this is not 69 is the fact that there's a small amount of space here. Pretty small amount of space. You would think that they would give it a little bit more leeway on this, but they're trying to pack as much stuff into these clay tablets as they can. So as with some other cultures, they're having to use this blank space to indicate a zero. You can now imagine the difficulty between, you know, what happens if I have a number 600 and nine, and I want to compare that now with 6,009, so I have two zeros. How much space do you put in there? How do you distinguish two spaces from three spaces and stuff like that? And that can become very difficult. So these spacing issues are really, really important in uh, the Babylonian number system. Uh, starts off even earlier than the, than the issue about zero. So 
notice the difference between the number two, in which case I have two of these cuneiform um, wedges uh, stuck together. And this is really important that they're essentially an overlap right there. Because if the two, two things are completely separate with even a minimal amount of space between them, but actually are physically separate, then this has to be two different digits. That has to be a one in the 60s position, and this is a one in the ones position. So this is representing 61, while that's representing a two. So at this very sort of low level, we have to be very careful about that issue of spacing. But again, as I showed on the previous screen, you know, this might be 69, and this might be 609, and there's just a small amount of it. You know, here I can, can't quite fit my ruler in between there, and here I've got space for about two rulers, at least two rulers wide. But it can be uh, something that is uh, easy to mistake. And so after a while, they began to use a special symbol. This is not true in the uh, early Babylonian, but in later Babylonian era. They're now using a special symbol, essentially the number two, but on an angle. Uh, so to, to indicate then that um, this is a real honest to goodness space. Okay, so this is now 609. And if I wanted to distinguish that between 6009, then I would use another pair of these things, a little bit more space, and then I would have one here, and then a second one here. And so I can tell how many zeros there are instead of just trying to guess my idea about how much space there is. But oddly enough, they really thought of this symbol as corresponding to the space between the digits. And so they essentially never used this at the end of a number. Um, uh, no mathematician that we know of, no accountant that we know of, uh, ever used this symbol as the last digit in a number, which means that they can't tell the difference between 6 and 60. Now, they would assume that we understood from context because they're discussing something. They're doing some kind of problem, and you should be able to tell roughly the order of magnitude of whatever the thing is that you're working on And uh, at that point. And so you can probably tell just from context whether it's a 6 or 60. But isolated from context, you cannot tell this. The astronomers who were working on uh, Babylonian uh, calculations were somewhat better. And so at least one Babylonian astronomer that we know of did, in fact, use this as a true zero by, putting, by also putting it at the ends of numbers. Uh, and that may have been more common than we have full evidence of. The astronomers were just basically better mathematicians uh, than what we would expect to see from the accountants. But the accountants and other kinds of mathematicians, those who were worried about taxes and government inventories and stuff like that, um, never used an, an additional z that zero at the end of the number, uh, although some astronomers uh, did. Um, so this, I, I, I hope, gives some indication of kind of the importance of the number zero. And, uh, and actually having a real honest symbol for a zero. Uh, I've said a couple of times during during class that uh, the only cultures to ever invent a true zero were the, uh, the, in the Asian Indians, the Hindu Indians, and the Mayans. Uh, but that what I mean by a true zero, I hope is a little bit clearer here. Uh, blank spaces can be equivalent to a zero, but they can be confused. Uh, those marks that the Babylonians used to indicate the space they didn't use it completely as a zero because they didn't put them at the ends of numbers and stuff. But a true zero, that's, that's actually fairly rare. Uh, and most cultures that used it at some point borrowed it from somebody else. In particular, the uh, Indian, the Hindu zero, of course, then gets... Uh, uh, that idea spreads easily to China and the uh, Islamic world and uh, uh, from there out to Europe and everywhere else. As I say, at least one later Babylonian astronomer used that zero at the end of the numbers, but most of them did not. And so it's hard to say the Egyptian number system didn't really have a zero. Maybe there was one, you know, brilliant mathematician who actually did use it like a zero, but culture-wise, culture-wide, they did not. Okay, uh, and those early Chinese numbers, which certainly predate the use of zero even in India. They used an empty box for zero on the counting boards, and so at least with respect to counting boards, they sort of really had a completely successful solution to the issue of dealing with zero. You just 
left the, that box empty. And you were doing all of these things on boxes, so the place notation was easy to understand. But uh, when you were writing the things down, this could be a problem. Okay? Not enough of a problem that I think that they really ended up being forced to address it. Because if I have a number like this, well, this is clearly the, the digit of 5, and this is clearly the digit 3 plus 5 for 8. Um, but there has to be uh, um, yeah, exactly, there has to be some zeros in between here because I'm going from uh, horizontal to horizontal. Uh, and we're supposed to start off in the ones position by using vertical lines. Remember, this doesn't count, it's the 5. So there must be a, a sort of a space here, an extra digit position here for a vertical thing. So probably that's the ones and here's the tens. Now it could have been that there were no, you know, zero ones, zero tens, zero hundreds, so zero ones, zero tens, zero hundreds, and eight thousands. So this could in theory be interpreted as eight thousand, but we might have, if we were writing, we could have then just left a substantial amount of space. And so if there's only a little bit of space, we know that this has to be 80. Okay? And in a similar sense, there has to be at least one space here, and there certainly isn't room for three. You might be able to get confused between, is that one, and one or two spaces? Is that two or three spaces? But here, we would, the only way we can really get a confusion is, is that one space or is it three spaces? Because we had to go from horizontal, skipping at least a vertical, and then back to the horizontal. Okay? So, um, uh, that's pretty darn close to a, to a zero, uh, but of course they don't really have a symbol at this stage, and it does not quite fully qualify as a zero. Okay? But again, only the Indians, only the Hindu Indians, and the Mayans invented a true zero. Uh, we, I'm give, giving dates here for the first known occurrence, uh, so the first known occurrence of a zero in Hindu uh, literature is it in 458 uh, uh, CE um, or AD if you're a uh, Christian and for the Mayans it's 36 B, uh, BCE before the Christian era so this is nearly 500 years earlier uh, than this um, it's very possible that they were using a zero as early as 200 uh, BCE so uh, possibly as far as 650 years before here and we just don't have written, enough written evidence to be sure of that. In the same sense, it's very possible, because it, because it looks like this, the, their number system with the zero is actually inherited from a previous culture, the Olmec. Uh, and they end, their, their culture sort of dies out about uh, 400 BCE. So if they did, in fact, inherit their system and their, the number zero from the Olmecs, which there is some reason to believe they might have, then this could be as old as 400 BCE. Uh, so depending on exactly which of those optimistic viewpoints of the age um, you accept, it's possible that the Hindu uh, zero predates the Mayans. But most likely the Mayans were the first inventor of a symbol for zero. The Hindu Indians are the most important one because that zero then spreads out to basically all of the other cultures in uh, Europe and Asia. Okay, so again, we'll be searching in the museum on Monday for some Mayan numbers and some Babylonian numbers. So make sure you have a good sense of what they look like.